the Cricket Bat. Famously made from English willow, built to withstand incredible forces. At the top level of the game, batsmen are facing balls delivered at over 90 miles an hour. When the bat connects with the ball, 8,800 newtons of force cause it to change direction in a millisecond. That's enough force to lift a small car. So how do you turn a lump of wood into a piece of performance equipment? Here in Robertsbridge, they've had plenty of practice. This village is where they make them, and they've been doing so ever since 1876, for famous players all over the world. Thankfully, today's bat makers lose fewer fingers. When the face of the bat has been shaped and cleaned up, it's put in this press. And are considerably funnier. So you see, the bat's face needs just as much care and attention as the girlfriend's does. Grey Nichols have been making bats here in Robertsbridge since 1876. It's a fifth generation family business that grows and harvests all of its willow in house. Grey Nichols plant 3,000 willow saplings at over 100 sites each year. Alex has worked for the company for nearly a decade. He knows his willow rather well. As long as I can't touch my fingers together, we're at about the size we want. So this has probably been in the ground around 18 to 20 years, gradually soaking up some moisture and growing up to a nice size. Should get some good bats out of it. Grey Nichols have factories in Australia and Asia, but all of their willow comes from the UK and passes through the sawmill. So once the trees have been bought in, they're then cut to length, 29 inch lengths. We roll them under the splitter, we split them open. Unlike cobblers, band makers are less cryptic when it comes to naming things. Round tree butts called rounds are rolled under the splitter and split into splits. So now that we've opened up this timber, we can see this has got a nice straight clean grain structure, that's pretty good. The colour in the red, that's just all from the core of the tree. So when it's made into cricket bats, there will be some red wood. But generally, these are pretty good looking pieces of timber. Alex aims to get eight cricket bats from one round. The splits are passed through three saws to be cut to the correct dimensions. So this is saw number one. What we're going to do is we're going to put the piece of timber in. We're going to cut straight through the high point on it, giving us two blades out of the one piece helping us to increase the yield of bats we get from each tree. On to saw number two. We're going to cut two nice parallel edges on there to give it the edge of the blade. And once it's been through here, we move on to saw number three. And what's going to happen is it's going to rest on an angle about 45 degrees and be passed through, putting the point on the blade at the back to give you your finished product. Once the splits have been rough sewn, they become clefts. Each cleft needs to be dried out to remove some of the moisture. After that, they need to be graded. So what we're first of all looking at is the grains, knots, blemishes and stains. Then you're looking at weight. You'll get some timber that's naturally much lighter in weight than others, and that's what we're after, especially when you're looking for bats for your international players. So this here is an absolutely cracking grade one. Now, grade four, to put in context, as you can see, you've got a big stain running through it, knots into the potential hitting zone here, and you can have some, we sort of pleasantly call them ugly belters. They're not great to look at, but they hit really nicely. But for a lot of people, it's how it looks will determine how it performs. There are currently a staggering 100,000 clefts stacked up in the warehouse. Many will be shipped to their international factories, but some of the high-grade timber is held for their UK bat makers. Once the cleft has dried out, it goes to the workshop. The bat maker decides which end is prettiest, and that becomes the face of the bat. Now that we can see the grain on the surface, you want to try and get the best possible point in the strike zone. So what we're going to do is we're going to fit the handle to this end, we're going to make this nice white wood area here the strike point. Alex makes the top and tail cuts, removing weight at the bottom and making a V-shaped incision for the handle. In the early years of the game, cricket bats were one solid piece of willow. As bowling speeds increased, so did the number of broken bats. In the 1830s, bat makers started to splice willow handles into the blades so they could flex to absorb the shock of striking the ball. Oh, lovely shot. That was a beautiful off-drive, which would sting his hands, but for a rubber shock absorber in the handle of the bat. Fascinating, isn't it? Bowling got faster still, 
and bat making evolved. Rubber infused cane handles were first introduced in 1853, giving batsmen the much needed shock absorber they use today. In the modern game, balls are being delivered at 90 plus miles an hour, so you need even more rubber in your handle. Modern handles are made from 12 laminated pieces of cane with three rubber springs as opposed to one. If you're, say, Alistair Cook and you're facing up to Dale Steyn and you dig out a Yorker, that's an impact speed of about 140 miles an hour. You need somewhere for that energy to go, and that's why you have this. It stops your hands, your fingers and your wrists from being broken by a cricket ball. With the handle glued firmly in place, it's beginning to look like a cricket bat. But unlike these fine young men, it's a little rough around the edges. Chris is responsible for shaping and pressing the blade, making sure the balance is just right. This one's going to be a bespoke bat, so it's aimed at a particular customer, so it's all to do with how they play the game, and also the preferred weight and balance of the way they play. And that can vary around the world from different surfaces and different sort of skills. So all I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of trim up a few of the extra bits that we don't need and shape a bit of the back of the blade. Chris selects a particular profile and draws it on with a pencil. This acts as a guide as he starts shaving down the timber. Chris needs to keep the bat within the dimensions stipulated by the Marylebone Cricket Club, the guardians of the game. Most of the tools are very traditional. The draw knife is probably the quintessential bat maker's tool. The bat makers with their draw knives are very much like batsmen and their bats. We all have our own little sort of sizes and weights and things. And, and this is from 1938. There's a belief in some of the carpentry trades that tool steel after the Second World War really dropped in quality. So you'll find a lot of guys sorting, searching out for uh, old tools. Bad makers still use the same tools and techniques. The only thing that's changed is the dress code. The back of the bat is now due for still more attention. Very highly skilled work indeed. What fun this man must have given grown-ups and boys alike. Some would say his life is to be envied. You know, I couldn't agree more. It wasn't long before Chris's skills gained him his first big commission. Legendary West Indian cricketer Shivnareen Shandapal paid a visit to the workshop, found a piece of willow he liked, and asked Chris to make him a bat. I'd never made a cricket bat for a pro, so I was a little bit nervous, and I was hoping John would do it for me. <laughs> and John goes, well, he asked you, and Shiv used that against England, and I was lucky enough to see some of it at the ground. John has racked up his half century. He's been at the company for 56 years. He's made so many bats, he stopped keeping score at 275,000. John holds the record for bats shaped in a day, 150, what cricketers call Daddy Century. But he's no plans to retire hurt. Retire? What's that? No, I'm just going to carry on as long as possible and probably bury me under the floor here. <laughs> <laughs> Many of John's bats have finished work, resting in the company museum after seeing action on the international stage. So we've got bats from all sorts of players, really. There's Andrew Strauss, uh, Laura Marsh, the England women's team player, David Gower. Um, and in the back row in, the, in some of these glass cabinets are some of the really old bats um, going right back to the 1800s. Once the bat has been roughly shaped, Chris needs to compress its face to create a hard shell. This is the tricky bit. This machine, when we're at full extension, is going to be putting about three tons per square inch onto the bat face, which is quite a lot for a piece of wood. Most of the pressure is focused in what will become the sweet spot. Normally, what you find is to get the highest performance out of a cricket bat, you're getting right to the edge of breaking it. <laughs> Willow is much more like a reed than it is a wood. It's that cellular structure inside. And when you compress that face, you end up with a really hard core on the outside, on the surface, and a nice, soft, spongy core underneath it. And it's that that gives the cricket bat its familiar ping and that lovely kind of bounce. So now it is really a performance piece of equipment rather than just a lump of willow. Chris continues to plane down the bat, getting closer and closer to the required weight and shape. Once you start getting to the basic profile, you start kind of picking it up um, in the hand like this to feel how it balances in the hand. And really then the shaping is all about putting the weight in the right place. In Australia, where the ball picks up high, bounces high, they might go to have the weight higher in the blade because that's where they're going to be contacting the blade a bit higher because it bounces up. Uh, somewhere skiddy, like a lot of the British pitches, uh, you'll probably go to have the weight a bit lower because it's not going to lift as high and you're more likely going to hit the ball lower down in the blade. 
The bat has been shaped, sanded and buffed. All that's left are the stickers and it's ready to knock one out the park. When you buy a bat, you're paying for the quality of the willow. Bat makers put the same love, care and attention into each one. You can buy a good quality cricket bat for under 100 quid. But their best bat, the legend, costs almost a thousand pounds. The legend is made from the top 1% of willow that we grow. So these are really beautiful bats. Not only does it have to be pristine cosmetically, it has to have the highest performance we can get out of a piece of willow. If you were to buy one of these and play cricket with it, you'd have the season of your life. These are almost too good to give to the pros. And what the pros tend to use be something more like this. This is actually called a pro performance, and it's designed to really be used on the world stage. That'll set you back around 600 pounds, but you get what you pay for, and a test batsman needs the very best. Oh, if I'm making a bat for a world-class batsman, Shivnareen Chandapal, his bats are two pounds, eight and a half ounces. He uh, has at least 13 grain across the face. The blade is a quarter of inch longer than standard. The handle's an inch shorter than standard. Uh, the weight for his bat is right down in the bottom of the blade. And he also likes a redwood edge on his bats. And it's done him pretty well. He's one of the great test batsmen of all time. In comparison, somebody like Alistair Cook pretty much takes a bat straight off the shelf, as long as it's the right weight, which is about two pounds 10, and it goes well, he's happy. And that's cricket born amongst the shepherds in the Kentish Wheels and developed in the fields of Sussex, where even today, as we've seen, willows are still felled and master craftsmen shape the bats as in days gone by.